This is lecture number nine in international human rights. What I'd look, like to look at today is the relationship of aid, development, justice, peace, and human rights. And these are tensions within the human rights story as they are within non-government organizations, government-assisted organizations, intergovernment organizations, how they interpret, how they deal with obvious tragedies, suffering, desertification, climate change, uh, water conditions in which water itself causes diseases. Um, you can, many of us who are, we be even channel surfing on TV can often see, for example, within government assisted organizations, they will show pictures of a child with a bloated stomach, inadequate food, water from wells or water from streams which have all sorts of bacteria in them that cause diseases and inevitably lead to deaths or serious illnesses with children. And these government assisted organizations they will flash pictures of children or women or men in which anyone who doesn't with a minimal heart feel some sort of tenderness towards the suffering is a heart of stone in that sense. But such means of advertising aid, because that's what they'll argue, look at the plight of these people, look at how they're suffering, look at their living conditions, food, water. What is not shown in those particular advertisements for fundraising is what is the context of that particular situation. You're shown a gruesome picture and then hopefully, this is their desire anyway, is that people will feel compelled. They evoke within people a desire to help. Um, but such sort of displays for fundraising don't tell those who are watching it, why is that situation the way it is? What's, where are they? What's the historic community like there? What's the country they're living in that leads to these implications? Now, aid often in the area of human rights is such that it can come from, obviously, where there have been famine, there can be storms in terms of tornadoes, there can be instant sort of and devastating activities of nature and inevitably where are these sort of catastrophes that go on is that people feel a certain sense I was there I would want people to assist us so many aid organizations which are usually partially funded by government usually one to two one to three ratio they draw they draw on emergency contexts or obviously human suffering contexts in which they encourage people to support their organizations, usually non-government or government assisted. Now to use the old aid development analogy, it's one thing if a person is starving and you get them fish so they're not starving anymore and that's often the role of aid organizations. They provide the goods for people who do not even have minimal sustenance, minimal food, minimal good water conditions to at least help them to survive. But within the aid development discussion, it's one thing to give a person a fish to help them to survive. It's another position, and this is where the development organizations and human rights come in. It's teaching people to fish so they can take care of themselves, so one does not have to slip into unhealthy dependency, which has often happened in the aid development industry, in a sense. And so between aid and human rights, in which organizations are there to assist people at rawest, in that sense, the, some of the most gruesome parts of life, but this is just a stopgap. It's an interim ethic to inevitably help people to be able to sustain themselves over the long haul so the aid organizations can step out. And so development, the whole work of development and human rights is built on the notion that these organizations, humanitarian organizations, aid development organizations, step in as a stopgap to assist, as it were, 
various communities to learn to fish themselves, to learn to read soil conditions, to know how to plant crops, to know um, education, vaccine, many other things like this in which communities become self-sustaining over the long haul and the aid organization drops out through education, through medicine, through proper agriculture, understanding water, understanding bacteria, understanding weather, uh, is that communities can be self-sustaining. And that's the underlying notion of development organizations and human rights, which usually are a step beyond aid organizations and human rights. But if I can alter the analogy once again, it's one thing to give a person a fish if they're starving, another to teach them to fish uh, so they don't need organizations. But what if just up the coast there's big multinational organizations which are polluting the waters in the name of their industry and as a result of that toxins come down the river and kill the fish. That's a justice question. So it's one thing for uh, development organizations to assist people or communities in terms of being self-subsistent, but communities don't exist in isolation. Communities exist within a social, political, economic context in which large corporations also exist often nearby. So the larger question, well, one is just ignore that and just teach in a developmental way people to be self-sustaining through education and other means. But as I said, if the context is such, one, if there's political conflict in a country, um, then all the work and development can come to naught where you have conflicting political parties, terrorist groups, political groups, civil unrest. Development itself can go nowhere um, if the conflict is, is intense or if you have large corporations that, in the name of profit, the implications of that are polluting and destroying the very development work goes on. Therefore, this is where justice organizations come along and it's you can't just bring peace in and ignore justice. So some the danger sometimes is isolating peace and justice as if, okay, the these development groups, there's peace within the community, but there's not justice outside of the community in a state in conflict. And so until there is some means of ensuring predictable justice within a state, um, what can happen is all the work of aid and development can come for naught and that money as it were and all that training just goes up and fire in, in many ways. And so peace itself presupposes an attempt to justly um, create structures within states themselves that then allow for communities that have been trained in development to be self-sustaining. But as I said, no communities are isolated from other communities. They're not isolated from the state they live in and any states are not isolated from other states. So where there is famine, where there's conflict, you'll get refugees crossing through states and back and forth. So the bigger areas of justice and peacemaking in one sense are far more foundational to aid and development than merely playing the aid development game itself. Now often there's a tension of course between aid and development organizations and justice and peace organizations. The justice and peace organizations tend to be very political uh, and challenging states and the lack of justice within their states and the implications of that for various types of uh, indigenous communities, uh, smaller communities that are non-indigenous, they manage to survive, um, basic, um, basic food, basic living standard, but where there is civil war within a country uh, and there is no one working to resolve that justly and peacefully, then all the work of aid and development organizations come to naught. And so now, most aid and development organizations will, for example, be funded one to two, one to three from governments themselves. Non-government organizations, which are concerned more with peace and justice, very rarely do they get funding from government because they ask political questions in terms of these, these, these states. So, for example, 
um, something like Amnesty International in Canada, when it asks questions about Saudi Arabia and Yemen, um, rather than just doing aid for, for example, the people uh, in Yemen, the persecution, our government is not, particularly our government's invested in Saudi Arabia or even Israel when you have um, Canadians asking serious questions about the treatment of the Palestinians, our government through a various assortment of government assisted organizations are quite willing to assist these organizations one to two, one to three, to work with the Palestinians in the West Bank, East Jerusalem. But they're not likely in many ways uh, groups like Amnesty who challenges what's actually happening in West Bank and Gaza. You're actually challenging Canadian policy in relationship to Israel. And so when you begin to go after Canadian foreign policy, they're not likely then to give you tax deductible status. So in the way governments often work in terms of the difference between non-government and government assisted and intergovernment, if a government assisted group or intergovernment tends not to challenge a government, the government will one to two, one to three funding. But a non-government organization like a Greenpeace, like an Amnesty International, if they in fact challenge the government head on in terms of its foreign policy interests, then often these non-government organizations do not get tax deductible status. And that's one way by which a government, in one sense, will direct where people give to get charitable status or not. And it's very under, important to understand how in the aid development justice piece, one's more charity driven aid development, the other's more justice peace driven. One gets funding by the government and tax deductible status. The other does not because it's questioned seriously a government's domestic and foreign policy. So when we think of human rights then, both at the level of theory and at the level of organization and at the level of tax deductible status, very important to understand how the ideology of aid and development collides with the ideology of justice and peace, the impact of that on how a government then will give tax deductible status to some organizations and not to other organizations based on how they understand that aid, development, justice, peace discussion when it comes to human rights.